Hello, welcome to Triple E One Five Seven Lecture Eight, or more uh, accurately, Week Eight. Uh, from the previous week, you learned about analog modulation and how analog communication systems work. How do we transmit analog information over a channel, whether it would be wired or wireless? In this lecture, we will be transitioning from analog to digital communications. So. Uh, this will be the outline of this presentation. Uh, the lecture series, this lecture series, will co be composed of four parts. Uh, basically, we're, ju we're just going to be talking about the transition from analog to digital signals. So the first step to having a digital communication system is to introduce your analog signals and convert them to digital signals. And there are three steps, sampling, quantization, and encoding. So I'll give you first an overview of how they all work and how they interface with each other. And then let's go into more specific details when we'll be talking about each different parts of your transition from sampling, quantization, and encoding. What are the different techniques and what are the advantages of some techniques over the others and so on and so forth. Okay. So analog versus digital signals. What are their difference? For, for, for an analog signal, it's continuous both in time and signal level. So you can see a smooth graph here. So a smooth sinusoid, that's an analog signal. So it's continuous everywhere. The difference between digital and analog for digital, it's discrete in both time and signal level. So the signals will, the signal rather, will only be, will only exist in certain time points. So here, 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 and so on and so forth. So these time points are equally spaced from each other. And as you can see also, the signal levels will only occupy a discrete number of levels. So it's not continuous in signal levels also. So in this case, this, this uh, signal at that time is, has a value of 2. Signal at time uh, here has a value of 5, and so on and so forth. So, uh, digital signals, when compared to analog signals, we're, we're converting analog signals to digital. Your digital signals cannot completely recreate analog signals. Because of the discretizing process, you're losing some information. If you want a more accurate representation of analog signals, you need to use more computer memory. Think of images. So images are digital nature, but when you're taking an image, you're taking an image of an analog picture. So you're taking an image of an analog picture, you need more number of more megabytes, more computer memory to have a clearer picture on your screen. If uh, you are using the older phones, you take a picture, it's actually not that clear because it uses less memory. So if you compare the same picture but one is in the kilobyte range, one is in the megabyte range. No doubt, the one in the megabyte range has more resolution compared to your uh, the picture in the kilobyte range. So the ones that use a lot of memory can more accurately recreate your analog image. However, it does not recreate it exactly. Some information is still lost. What's the advantage then of digital signals compared to analog? The digital signals, when you transmit them, they're, they're in bits. It's more robust against noise compared to analog signals. When you transmit analog signals with noise, the noise will always be there. But for digital signals, you can blur out or you can reject the noise compared to analog signals. So if you transmit your digital signal from one point to another, the quality of that digital signal will still be the same compared to your analog signal. Okay, so in this, in the next lecture next week, you will learn more about that. So how digital signals can be transmitted without loss and so on and so forth. It's because the main reason because of uh, behind that is that your digital signals can be regenerated compared to your analog signals. If your analog signals are all uh, already is corrupted with noise, it will always be corrupted with noise, and that's the main advantage of digital signals compared to analog signals. Okay. okay. Also, when we talk about digital signals, we can convert them, represent them into bits. So, different types of files. You have your text file, documents, PDFs, photos, videos, sounds, can be represented in the form of bits. 
that means you can use the same digital transmission system to transmit all of those files. So using the same hardware, you can transmit any type of file, unlike your analog, uh, analog communication system where you have your speech communication system. If you want to uh, transmit or broadcast your television images, you need another hardware and so on and so forth. So just an overview of a digital communication system. The first step is to convert your analog signal to digital signal. Okay, and that's this three parts of our the chain of blocks right there. Okay. So that is your analog to digital conversion process. You have a sampler, quantizer, and encoder. Okay. So after sampling, you get your continuous valued sequence, but it's a sequence of values. Not, not an analog signal that is continuous in time. For, for your uh, sampled signal, you have a continuous valued sequence, but it's already a sequence. After quantizing, you have a discrete valued sequence. It's still a sequence, but now it's mapped into different signal levels. I will more about that later. After that, when you have your discrete signal levels, you now proceed to encode. So you're encoding the signal into bits. So you have, let's say, a discrete value would be 1, you encode that into bit or a bit sequence 0, 0, 001. So you now have a, a bit, se bit sequence after your discrete valued sequence after encoding. And that is already uh, fed into the modulator, which is the digital modulator here, and it will be transmitted to a channel. The receiving process does the opposite. Okay, And mainly, uh, the, main, the, the main thing here, the, the, the uh, the crucial component of a receiver is a low-pass filter. The low-pass filter smoothens the signal. And more on that as we go along. Okay. So these are the three steps. As I've mentioned earlier, sampling first. Sampling discretizes time. Then quantization, you discretize the signal level. And finally, encoding, you map your signal levels, different signal levels into bits. So the output of your analog to digital conversion will always be a sequence of bits that will be fed into the modulator. The modulator will convert it into something that can be transmitted over a channel. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. For now, we'll focus on these three steps on converting analog to digital to, uh, digital signals. Okay. So the sampling process quite simply discretizes with time. You have already encountered this. So in its simplest form, your sampling takes an analog signal and you, you'll get the values of that analog signal in fixed intervals. So let's say you're going to get it here, 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 and here. And you now have a sample for every 0 0.1 seconds of your analog signal. Okay? Sample every 0 0.1 seconds. And now... At, at the end of this, when you have sampled it, you now have a discrete valued se sequence right here. So, as you can see, the x-axis of your second image is already in the form of integers. So, this will be the zeroth index, first index, the first sample, second index, and so on and so forth. Basically, your x of t will become an x of n right here. So, the resulting output of your sampling process is a series of impulse functions. So you can think of the sampling process as a series of impulse functions. Okay? So recall that impulse functions are a fun uh, functions that have uh, okay. an impulse function right here has a width of 0. So the whole area of your impulse function is concentrated at one point in time. So you have a series of that with different values, different areas, you have a sampled signal. Okay. However, after sampling, your X of N is still analog since the sample levels here are continuous. There's no discrete steps that you can see here in this uh, sampled signal. Quantization does that. It discretizes the signal levels. So if you have a sampled signal, it will be converted to discrete valued, uh, discrete valued to a discrete, discrete valued signal. So the, 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 the easiest way to quantize a signal is to map it into integers. Okay? Where the lowest level would correspond to 0, 
and the highest level would correspond to 7 here in this example, but it depends on the number of bits that you are using per symbol. So basically, you have a continuous valued signal, you will be mapping them into integers. So for example, here, within the range uh, negative 0 0.1 to 0 0.1, right, it will be mapped into 3. If it goes beyond that, right here, as you can see, this signal is mapped into integer 4. If you look at this part, the 3 in the three near the uh, maximum swing of your sinusoid, they're all mapped to the same value at 7. Right? And that's how quantization works. So we can see already here that there's some form of loss because of quantization. You, you can't completely recreate your sinusoidal signal. But how... How, how can we uh, have a more accurate representation? If we increase the number of bits, we increase the number of integers. Here, we're using 3 bits. And we have 3 bits. If you have 3 bits, then you have 8 representations. If you count the discrete steps here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. If you have 4 bits, then you have 16 uh, discrete levels. And if you have 16 discrete levels, you can recreate your sinusoid better. The relationship between them is here. So if you have m symbols and b bits, their relationship is m is equal to 2 raised to b. Right? And the difference between the range of values of two discrete values here is called delta, and we call it the quantization step. It's an important parameter to characterize the loss of information for your quantization process. And we'll talk about talk more about this in a uh, the later part of the lecture okay the final step is encoding so when you get your integer sequence sorry <laughs> integer sequence from your sampled signal from your quantized signal so you get an integer sequence this is just one way of encoding it there are actually different ways so first we have an integer sequence and then convert that to their natural bit mapping so when you convert 3 to binary, that's 0, 1, 1, 4, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. Okay, So from your integer sequence, you're going to map them into a bit sequence. That's the process of encoding. But this is just one uh, simple way of encoding. There are actually more, uh, there are different ways of encoding, more complex but more efficient ways of encoding. And we'll talk about that when we're going to discuss the encoding part. But this is the simplest form. You have your integer sequence from quantization. Uh, from your integer sequence, naturally just map them into their uh, binary conversion. Right? And it depends, again, it depends on the number of bits used in quantization. So they're related to each other. And again, if you want to, use, if you want to have a more accurate representation, let's say 4 bits, you use more bits here just to represent your signal. So you're using more computer memory just to represent an analog signal more accurately. And you can see how uh, these two are related to each other. So if you want to represent your your if you want to represent your analog signal more accurately, you need to use more complex encoding. And there's a trade-off actually. There is an inherent trade-off between the amount of memory, the amount of storage memory used in a computer, and your uh, the complexity of your encoding. So if you want to use less computer memory, you need to have more complex uh, encoding. And maybe you have encountered this in an image. So uh, your some cell phones, some smartphones can capture an image or a video, right, let's talk about videos. Some cell phones can capture videos using what we call the HEVC encoding or high efficiency video coding. Maybe some of you have already encountered this HEVC. The HEVC can create high quality videos around even, even 1080p resolution. Okay, let's say an hour of a video we can store that at around 200 megabytes only. We can store it using just 200 megabytes of memory, an hour. This is one hour of a video. 
compared to other codecs, other coding schemes, uh, some coding schemes, when you have an hour of a 1080p video, uses 4 gigabytes. It's high quality. So, what's the trade-off here? We can store a high quality video, an hour of 1080p video, high resolution. Okay? We can store that using 200 megabytes compared to the other one. We're storing it 4 gigabytes, a different coding scheme. The trade-off here is that your computer uses more RAM just to process this HEVC video. So you're actually do, uh, letting your computer do more work just by decoding this video because it's stored so efficiently. So there's a trade-off between processing power and storage memory when we are talking about encoding. There's an inherent trade-off. And this will be obvious when you're talking about uh, information theory so and that's the last part of this course so we won't talk about it here but heads up there's a trade-off between them that's it okay so just to summarize this uh, introduction basically you can't recreate an analog signal using a digital signal but if you want to be more accurate in the recreation of the analog signal you need to use more memory if you don't want to use more memory You'll need to use a more complex coding scheme, which makes your computer do more work. Okay. So, the main advantage of digital signals is it offers more reliability and flexibility. So, the same hardware can be used to transmit different types of data. And error detection and correction is possible because of the discrete, uh, discrete nature of your digital signal. And finally, your sampling discretize this time, quantization signal level, and encoding, we're converting those quantized signal levels into bits. So more about that, the next part, sorry, the next part is sampling. More about all of them in the next parts of this lecture. Okay, so if you have any questions in this video, do not hesitate to leave a comment in the comment section below, and see you next meeting.